Well, good morning and welcome to Victory Baptist Church. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning as we worship the Lord and we praise Him. For Jesus Christ is our salvation, and in Him all our sins are forgiven. And that should fill your hearts with joy this morning. Well, the countdown is officially on. As I count, there's only five more sleeps until Christmas, and I'm wondering if you can, can you feel the anticipation building? And I, I know within my household we're starting to feel it. And as I, was, as I was thinking about that anticipation building within us as we wait for Christmas Day and was thinking about all the things we do to prepare for the day, um, I kind of started to make that list of what do we do, and I, I see that we prepare our homes, we, we decorate our homes, we, we shop for the day, we sing songs about the coming of the day, we, 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 we invite people over, we, have, we send one another Christmas greetings, we start talking about it because we're so excited about it, especially the children, and I must say it's, it seems a lot easier for children to express their joy as they anticipate the day, and I think we could learn a little bit from some of our kids in the way we express joy. And then by the time Christmas Eve comes, we we're so excited, it's even hard to sleep at times because we, we're excited and we're just, we can't wait for what the day is going to bring. And as I thought about this anticipation, this is, this is the type of joy and anticipation we are to have for the coming of, of Christ at his second coming. And in our Advent reading this morning, we are told that John the Baptist was born shortly before Jesus. And God had given him this special job to do. He was go, to go before Jesus and prepare people for him. He was to tell them that, get ready, anticipate it, because one day you are going to meet Jesus. And his father, Zachariah, said this uh, about John. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and said in Luke 1, 76, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. John was to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. He went around telling them, get ready, because the day is coming where you are going to meet him. Anticipate it. Get prepared. And similar to this idea of how we anticipate uh, Christmas Day, we prepare for it. They were to anticipate Jesus' arrival. And not just prepare their homes, but they were to prepare themselves. They were pre to prepare their hearts for Jesus Christ. And Christmas is this reminder that we are to prepare our hearts for Jesus we are to anticipate his coming. We are to get ready for it. And we may not know how many sleeps we have until Jesus comes back, but the countdown is on. Can you feel the anticipation building? Do you know that joy that comes from knowing Jesus Christ? And that when he returns with him, he will bring the gift of eternal life. And that should fill our hearts with joy this morning. So my encouragement to us is together, let's praise the Lord. Let that joy that fills your heart because you know Christ just pour out of you. And kind of like the children that we know, we, we, sometimes we might have to loosen up a little bit. But just let it pour out of you. For Christ is coming. Prepare your hearts for him. This morning we're going to start off with our Advent reading it's going to be read by Elaine McDougall, and I just want to thank Elaine for all the work she has put into these Christmas readings for us, and also her sound engineer, Jeff, who diligently recorded her. We appreciate uh, this ministry to us. This is our Advent reading found in Luke.
Luke 1, 57 to 67 and 76 to 79. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. This is the word of the Lord.
we can have great joy because the Lord has come at Christmas time. And when He came, He came for the people of Israel. He came to a, a nation that was mourning in lowly exile. And so this morning we want to sing of this coming King, this coming Emmanuel, God with us. people. You brought them life. Lord, we praise you because we now are your people, adopted into your family, made children of God. And we thank you for the way that you have brought us in 
and allowed us to have eternal life through your Son who came on Christmas morning. Amen. Still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, and in this world of sin, nor meek souls will receive him still. The true Christ enters in. Holy child of Bethlehem, descend on us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Amen. I have some good news. We're going to play the video now. It can be hard to know what's going to happen in the future. What's going to happen at school tomorrow? What about that big test I have to write? Am I going to do okay on it? What am I going to be when I grow up? Life is full of these big questions that we don't have the answers to. And not knowing what the future holds can be kind of scary. We get all worried because we don't know what life has in store for us. But the Bible tells us that we don't need to be worried or scared. When Jesus was born into that quiet town of Bethlehem, he showed the whole world that God truly loved them. And by sending his one and only son, God proved that he had a plan for our future. Jesus is the solution to all of our sin. We don't have to face death anymore. We get to live forever. So we don't need to worry about the future because we know what's going to happen. Jesus is coming back for us one day. 
And when he comes, he's coming with all his glory. There is hope for the future and there is peace from our troubles today. All because Jesus was born in the town of David. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in Jesus tonight. I now have some good news for you. I got Christmas on the brain. I don't, I don't know what's happening. The good news is this. The membership vote that we had for uh, Daniel and Imelda Robbins was completed this week, and I want to welcome them into membership this morning. It's such good news uh, that they are now a part of the congregation as far as in, in membership. And I'm just thankful for their faith and their commitment to the ministry here at the church. And so to Daniel and Imelda, we, we welcome you into membership. And I know that we all can't be together this morning, but uh, reach out to them and, and just congratulate them. It's, it's good to have you a part of this. One of the ways that we can express our love for God and our thankfulness and praise to him for all that he has given to us in, this, in our life is by giving a portion of our finances to his work. And this is not something we do because we feel forced to, but it is to come from a heart that worships God. And it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, God loves a cheerful giver. And so this morning we, we come to give of our finances to the Lord. And in a moment we are going to give thanks uh, for our offering and all that God has given us. And our hope is that through our giving, God will cultivate it's a great harvest of faith and love through the ministry here at the church. And one of the ways that you can give to the ministry here is through e-transfer, and you can give at donation at victorybaptist.ca, and that will come up on your screen. It's donation at victorybaptist.ca. So together, let's just bow our hearts before the Lord and just give thanks for all that he has blessed us with in our life. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just come before you, praising your name, thanking you, Lord, for all that you have given us. Lord, in your great mercy, you sent us Jesus Christ, your Son, who took the penalty for our sin, who paid our debt for us so that we could be set free. And Lord, we just, this morning we gather just to give back to you. We give our praise to you. And we come to give a portion of our finances to you, Lord, for we know that all that we have uh, belongs to you. And we give that with cheerful hearts, Lord, that you would use it in mighty ways just to cultivate a, a great harvest here at Victory Baptist Church of faith and love in Christ Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you just be with each one of us uh, and continue to provide for our needs, for is out of the riches of Christ that you give to us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, you can open up your Bibles as Pastor Jason comes to preach. You can open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 52, and we'll begin reading in verse 7. And I just want to say, uh, I don't know whether I drew the, the short stick here this morning, but uh, I get the privilege of speaking to an empty room again, and uh, I don't know how that ended up happening, but I'm saying if this lockdown stuff keeps happening, we're going to have to get cardboard cutouts of people in this room because uh, we really do miss uh, seeing your face in person and we look forward to the time that we can get back to that. But let's uh, read our, our text here this morning from Isaiah 52 beginning in verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. 
The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And this is the word of the Lord. Have you ever sat in a hospital waiting room? Many of you, I'm sure, have been there before, and I want you to just imagine uh, perhaps a, an unimaginable uh, scenario. Your child or a close relative has been in a terrible accident. You rush to the hospital, and you go into that waiting room, and you sit, and you, you wait for news of how they are doing. And, and as you are sitting and waiting, thoughts begin to race through your mind. How bad is it? Will there be permanent brain damage? Will they be able to walk again? Will they come through the surgery okay? Will there be, will there be complications with the surgery? All these thoughts keep going through your head, and you try to maybe think of, of something else, but the hours drag on, and, and that waiting room is, is just such a terrible place to be. The hours just creep or so slowly. And all that time, you're waiting for the door to open, to see that familiar face of the surgeon, to hear either his reassuring words of everything is going to be okay, or those words that you can hardly fathom, I'm so sorry. It is a moment where our lives hang on that razor edge between unimaginable sorrow and unspeakable joy as we wait for the doctor to step through that door. Of course, we need not have been in this situation to know the joy of good news. No grandparent will likely forget the announcement of their first grandchild. No parent will forget the time that they found out that they were expecting. Uh, we might not forget that time where we were accepted into college or when we saw our kid graduate. There are certain moments in our life that bring us un imaginable, unspeakable joy. And when we turn to our passage this morning, Isaiah gives us a picture of a situation very much like the one I painted uh, for you just a moment ago. God, Isaiah is speaking to a group of people who are waiting and watching. And into the situation of, of waiting and longing, Isaiah gives the people of Israel an image of an event to come. But he tells them that even in this place of waiting, of expectation, even there, then where they are now, they may rejoice because there is good news that is coming. And in this passage this morning, what I want to show is that this is good news, not just for the people to whom Isaiah is addressing this, but it is good news for us. It is good news uh, for, for you and I uh, that we have not been forgotten. That there is a king who has defeated our enemies. That there is a God who reigns and who is returning. It is good news that in this season that we find ourselves in of, of weariness, of longing, of perhaps even loneliness, that there is a God who reigns. That there is good news that can cause us to rejoice. Let me just uh, begin with a word of prayer before we, we dig into uh, our passage a bit more. Heavenly Father, as we, we gather together this morning, physically distant, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the ability that we have even to gather in the way that we are this morning. May you be with each one of us, Lord, as we gather around our devices or our TVs, and may you speak into our hearts from your word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word 
uh, reveals. Your word uh, speaks into our hearts, so in your word changes us. And we ask, Lord, that uh, you would we'd honor the preaching of your word this morning, that it might do so, that it might speak powerfully into our hearts and lives, and that we might leave as changed people this morning. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we jump into our text, if you were following along with us uh, a few months ago, you'll remember that we did a series uh, through Isaiah 40 to 55. And uh, you might remember that this section of the book is a distinct one in the book of Isaiah. It is distinct because uh, between chapter 39 and chapter 40 uh, is, is a huge time gap. And uh, so when we look at chapter 39, uh, Isaiah is writing as though the, the exile has yet to come. He's, he's anticipating uh, the Babylonian exile, which would happen in 587 BC. But by the time we reach chapter 40, Isaiah is speaking about uh, as though that has already happened, that that event has already transpired, that, that tragic event that shook the nation has already happened. And so what happens is Isaiah's prophecies in these chapters move forward along in history to show a glimpse of life beyond the exile. And so if we're reading through the book of Isaiah, what we will notice is when we get to these chapters, there is a shift in tone. Where everything before in chapters 1 to 39 was this, this message of judgment on the nation, chapter 40 to 55 is one of comfort and restoration as it anticipates the defeat of the Babylonians and the return of the people from their long exile. It's one of the reasons that this section of the book speaks uh, so powerfully to those who need encouragement, because that's the very purpose for which Isaiah penned these chapters. And one of the, uh, if we look within these chapters between 40 to 55, where we find ourselves in chapter 52 is uh, at, at another transition point. Before this uh, God had promised to uh, rebuild Jerusalem, to send the exiles back through the hand of uh, King Cyrus, the Persian king. And what happened was Cyrus came in and conquered uh, the Babylonians and in the process set free uh, the people of Israel to return home. But something happens when we reach chapter 49 is what we see is that's not God's entire program for the return of his people. God begins to address the problems that led to the exile in the first place and shows how he is going to rebuild the relationship, the broken relationship that he has with the people. And so this morning we're going to uh, look, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, of how do we rejoice uh, in the midst of our present circumstances? What reasons do we have to rejoice? And I see in this text three distinct time references that Isaiah uses. Isaiah speaks of the past, the present, and the future. And my three points will kind of look at those three time stamps. Isaiah speaks of a past victory, a present reign, and a future coming. And we'll see how these all fit in to Christ's coming, through in his exaltation and his future return in glory. So my first point when we look at our passage is this. We can rejoice because Christ has defeated our enemies. If we turn to our passage, we are met with a, a vivid image of a city breathlessly awaiting news from the front lines. As the city waits we see in verse 8 the watchmen standing upon uh, the battlements of the city wall, gazing out into the distance, looking for the return of a messenger with news from the battle. Then, suddenly, it's as though they see this, this speck in the distance. There is a runner running. And he's carrying with him news. And as he approaches, they hear the words from his mouth, Peace! Peace! Good news! 
Isaiah is using this powerful metaphor that would have easily been understood by people of this time. Remember, this is, this is an age without, without cell phones or anything. So the way that they heard news was through runners who would run from the battle. We see the same situation in 2 Samuel 18. Uh, King David is sitting at the gates of the city, and, and his watchmen are up on the walls looking into the distance, waiting for the messenger to arrive to tell him how, how news of the battle uh, and how it has t- taken place. In David's case, uh, the, the news is bad, but in Isaiah's image, the messenger's news resounds with joy. And as it is announced, we see this message echo through the city. Notice how this praise almost ripples it begins with the solo voice of the messenger crying out good news, peace, salvation. But then when we get to verse 8, we meet this group of watchmen. And upon hearing this news, now they raise their voices in song. But then uh, in verse uh, 9, we see uh, the choir, the whole choir joins in the song as the waste places join in the song as well. And these waste places uh, not only talk about the, the, the physical ruins of Jerusalem, but they are an image of the people as a whole. Here are people whose lives are in ruins. They are defenseless against their enemies, helpless in their guilt and despair. But now they are given a reason to rejoice. This rippling effect is showing us that there's this contagiousness to the joy. It's a a message that has to spread because it concerns everybody. And what Isaiah is depicting for us here is that the battle is already won. This is why the messenger is running. The victory has already taken place. An attentive reader will be reminded of a similar uh, statement that we find all the way back in chapter 40. And it'll show up on your screen. Isaiah 40, 1 to 2, we read that Isaiah's first word was very similar to this messenger's. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended. And if we go a bit bit further down in that same text, Isaiah is told to go up on a high mountain and proclaim good news because the Lord is coming with might and his arm rules for him. We see these same images of, of good news, of God comforting his people, of God bearing his arm. This image of, of, of God, uh, bearing his arm, uh, means that he, he is coming to save. It's a military image. And in this time, in this culture, uh, in the way that they would wear their clothes, uh, you would rest your arm in the front sort of fold of your garment, sort of in the same way that we might rest our, our, our hands in our pockets today. You would rest it in that fold. And what would happen is when you went to go act, you would remove it from the fold and you would bear your arm. It told, it told people that you were about to act in the same way that we might roll up our sleeves today. God bearing his arm says that he is ready to act on Israel's behalf. But not only that, it is going to be something that is publicly seen. The world will see God bearing his arm. The nations, Isaiah tells us in verse 10, will see God's salvation. And so, while Isaiah speaks of their deliverance as accomplished, we know that when Isaiah wrote this, that deliverance still lay in the future. And so we ask ourselves, how can he say the Lord has comforted his people or that he has redeemed Jerusalem? And commentators say that what this is called is a a prophetic perfect verb. What it means is, It's speaking as though future events have already taken place. 
And Isaiah can speak that way because of the God he serves. God's promises are as good as fulfilled because of who he is, because he is faithful. The deliverance this points to for Israel, the victory, is the ret- their return from exile. And yet while it lies in the future for Israel, this good news is one that we can look back on ourselves. We know of a far greater news than the return to Jerusalem. You see, the deliverance from Babylon is far from the great deliverance that Scripture points us towards. God's deliverance of the people from Egypt, from Babylon, are like the appetizers preparing us for the main course. And in the opening of Mark's gospel, we find John the Baptist as a messenger proclaiming an equally good message, one that is even far greater, in fact. He begins by saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And by beginning with these words, Mark wants us to see that this is not an ordinary king that is coming, but God himself who is coming to deliver his people. And John, a few verses later, will say, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Here is another messenger of good news. The king is coming to his people to establish his reign. But as we work through the Gospels, what we see is that the enemies that Jesus delivers us from are unlike the enemies we often have in mind. You see, I, one of the ten- tendencies we have is often we, we look at our problems as something outside of ourselves. Have you ever noticed that uh, when you're caught doing something, we often try to uh, pin it on circumstances going on around us? So if someone asks you, you know, why did you do that? Well, you know... Uh, I I didn't get enough sleep last night, Uh, my temper was short, blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, it's the people at work, they just drive me crazy. Or, Or it's these kids, like, why don't they go and have a nap? We blame our circumstances, but we, we're very, very rarely do we, are we willing to see that the problem is, is something in ourselves You see, when Jesus comes, he comes not to bring deliverance on the world's terms, but he starts at the very root of the problem. He comes to deliver us from our enslavement to sin. And that, that is the cause of everything that ails us. You see, Israel's mistake would be to see that their exile was just a an unfortunate event of history that, you know, a, a political problem rather than the fact, it it wasn't just a a, a physical exile. It was a spiritual exile and estrangement from God that was the root of the problem. The problem with always blaming something outside of ourselves is we don't ever get to the heart of what motivates us to do the things that we do. And the word the Bible uses to describe this motivation is sin. Sin is this distortion of our desires and of our actions. In Romans 7, Paul speaks of it as as this power that enslaves him so that even when he has the desire to do what is good, what he finds is he does the very opposite. Sin lives in me, he says. It's this slave master, this this ruler that is far greater of a problem than Babylon ever would is. The problem, I think, when we mention sin today is that um, if we were to kind of eavesdrop on everyday chit-chat, it, it is, it's rare to ever hear people talk about sin, isn't it? It's not a kind of word we throw out in casual conversation, and so what we often do is we'll hear words like uh, moral failure or mistakes or or, or an offense. 
But just because we don't have the language doesn't mean we don't see the symptoms of it in our lives. Uh, T.S. Eliot gets at this in his play, A Cocktail Party. And he has this character named Celia uh, Copplestone. And uh, earlier in the play, she is pursuing a married man and is having an affair. But th this affair comes to an end. And as she kind of comes to term with the end of this relationship, she begins to feel this emptiness inside of her. And she, she's, she's struggling to understand what it is in her life that is missing. And sitting down with a, a friend of hers who is a doctor, she, she's, she begins to kind of unpack what it is she's experiencing. And this is what she says. She says, it sounds ridiculous, but the only word for it that I can find is a sense of sin. See, everything seems so right at the time. I've been thinking about it over and over. I can see now it was all a mistake but I don't see why mistakes should make one feel sinful. And yet I can't find any other word for it. What, what Celia is grappling with is sin is far more than just a mistake. Something we, it, it's far more than something we kind of accidentally trip ourselves on. She, and she goes on, she says, it's not a feeling of anything I've ever done, which I might get away from, or of anything in me I could get rid of, but of emptiness, of failure towards someone or something outside of myself. And I feel I must atone. Celia is, is grappling with trying to find the language to make sense of a feeling deep inside of her. And, and what I, I bring her this example up because perhaps that's something you yourself feel or grappling with. It's far more than just a mistake or having done a couple things wrong. It's this feeling of estrangement, of emptiness, of loss. The reason Jesus' disciples are so bewildered as they watch Jesus go to the cross is they believe Jesus has come to treat the symptoms but Jesus has come to eradicate the disease. They want an end to their political woes, but their political woes are a result of sin. Jesus has come for a different enemy. It is the enemy that enslaves Celia. It is an enemy that enslaves the people of Israel. And it enslaves you and me. To defeat that enemy requires a king who would make atonement. If you go back to Isaiah, one of the fascinating things is, as I mentioned earlier, in the, the verses, in chapters 41 to 49, Cyrus is the real hero. He's this po powerful political ruler who comes and delivers the people. But Cyrus can only bring them so far. He can only bring political deliverance. But he can't offer them atonement. And in chapter 53, verse 10, we see a servant. And it says that this servant, upon him, he makes an offering for guilt. And then further on, that he, uh, through him, uh, he will make many righteous and he will bear their iniquities. You see, the problem that the people had is something that Cyrus could never deliver them from. It was their sin guilt. It was atonement, the thing that Celia sought. There is only one that can do that. In 2 Corinthians 5, we read that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he did this by making him to be sin, making him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ came and he won the victory by bearing your sin and mine upon himself. And this is the basis of true joy. Because if sin is our greatest enemy and Jesus Christ has bared it in himself, then we are set free. The wages of sin is death. But Christ, in purchasing us from sin and the control of sin, has bought our freedom from the realm of death. 
And Paul will write in Romans that through faith in Christ and his grace, we can, can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We can rejoice because our greatest enemy has been overcome. Secondly, we can rejoice because Christ reigns presently. Christ reigns. One of the questions the exile posed to the people of Israel was the question, who reigns? Who is the true king? And as they watched their glorious city go up in flames and people being led away in shackles, the people began to wonder and became, came to two conclusions. Either God had forgotten them or he was not powerful to save. And, and what we see is when we go to the book of Daniel, this was the same conclusion that Nebuchadnezzar, the conquering king who invaded Jerusalem, it's the same conclusion he came to. And so when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, at one point, he disdainfully asked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? You see, in Nebuchadnezzar's world, he's riding high. He has conquered the known world. And in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, he says, if your God failed you back then, he's, he's, a no, he's no God. He won't deliver you now. He won't deliver you from the burning furnace. The people bought Nebuchadnezzar's mentality. They too started to believe that God couldn't deliver. Have you ever been in a car with a bad driver? And don't look at your spouse next to you if that applies to them. Just keep looking straight ahead. Maybe they drive too close behind someone. Maybe they text while driving, or maybe they're just generally a bad driver. There's some people that just don't have it, I think. But I recall one time being in a car with a friend who suddenly thought it would be a great idea to pass on a curve. And as the words were still coming out of my mouth, don't do it, it just felt like it was slow motion, we were already in the oncoming lane, and he was pedaled to the floor. But what made this pass particularly scary was as soon as we pulled out, there, we were looking at the headlights of a car coming right at us. Obviously, I'm here, still here, so we made it. But it's that feeling of when you're in the passenger seat in a situation like that is this feeling of total powerlessness. You can't drive that car. Somebody else is steering it and is driving it. You can't steer yourself away from the coming disaster. And I think sometimes our lives, our lives feel like that, like we're the passenger in a car that is driven by somebody else. And all we want to do is just take that wheel and steer it in the, the way we want it to go. But we can't. And this is how the people uh, of Israel felt. And Isaiah speaks uh, to this sense of abandonment or their sense that things are, are out of control. And we see this word that he brings from God to the exiles in chapter 40, verse 27. God says to them, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. What, God, what Isaiah wants these exiles to see is that their vision of God is too small. You see, they, they see a God who is only real as long as he works on their behalf, who is, who is only uh, good when, he, uh, when they, he's mighty, or he's only mighty when they win, a God who fits their view of how a God should act. That's the kind of God they want. But Isaiah reminds them that just because God's way is hidden from them doesn't mean that their way is hidden from God. God is no less God when we fail to see how he is working or when. Hans Urs von Balthasar writes that God intended man to have all good but in God's time. And therefore all disobedience, all sin, consists essentially 
in breaking out of time. Patience, he says, is uh, the basic uh, constituent of Christianity, the power to wait, to persevere, to hold out, to endure to the end, not to transcend one's own limitations, not to force issues by placing the hero, by playing the hero or the titan, but to practice the virtue that lies beyond heroism, the meekness of the lamb which is led. As Christians, we are called to be led by our shepherd. And so, what Isaiah says is, those who wait on the Lord will find strength. Just because God isn't acting doesn't mean that he is not on his throne, reigning. And so the question becomes, as we flip forward in the pages of Scripture, when does the king arrive? By the time we reach Zechariah, who's come back with the exiles, Zechariah will write as though the king hasn't arrived yet. And he awaits the time when he will. And that longing and waiting for the king continues to linger well beyond the return from exile. And when we turn to the opening pages of Luke's gospel, we meet a man named Simeon, an old man. And it says that he is waiting for the consolation or the comfort of Israel. And we meet this other older individual, a widow named Anna, And it says that she is waiting for the redemption or the salvation of Jerusalem. Richard Hayes points out that both these words, comfort and redemption, echo the same words we find in our text in verse 9. They are waiting for the fulfillment of Isaiah's word. But suddenly, Jesus is carried into the temple and Simeon rushes over and takes the baby into his arms and we read in Luke 2, 29, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the, of revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Here is the king. And as we go through uh, Luke's gospel, we see how Jesus' light shines brighter and brighter into the world. And as we move into Acts, that message goes into the world. And by the time we close the book of Acts, we see how this light of revelation to the Gentiles has now reached Rome. Paul is reaching in Rome. This light is growing stronger and stronger. Jesus by leaving, being resurrected, and ascending, he's no less king. In fact, what the Bible says is that when he was ascended into heaven, it was his enthronement ceremony, his exaltation. Ephesians says that he, God seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And it is from there that he rules, and he, he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. You see... We as believers, we as a church, are an outpost of the kingdom in a foreign land. We are heralds, messengers, proclaiming the good news that there is a king who reigns from heaven. A king who uh, rules a different kingdom than the world we live in. It is the good news that we have not been forgotten or abandoned. And that is surely a reason to rejoice. Lastly, we can rejoice because Christ will return. We can rejoice because Christ will return. I've already mentioned that our passage, uh, in this passage, the people rejoice in anticipation. We see that the ends of the earth have not seen the salvation of our God. They shall see it. And uh, the messenger comes because to tell them that the the Lord has won his victory, but the king has not arrived yet. The good news is that the victory is won. And, you know, a a common phrase that's used by New Testament scholars is to describe the process of salvation is the already, but the not yet. And what it's used to describe is this tension that we live in between a work that is completed 
but is yet to be consummated in its fullness. We live between uh, the fulfillment and the consummation. And, And so if we look at our text, it's this tension that we see at work in Isaiah between the fact that the victory is won, but the king has not yet arrived. And that same tension exists within ourselves. While Christ has won the victory over sin, uh, we still live in a world that is characterized by it. Sin has not been destroyed forever. And if we look at ourselves, even though we are set free from sin, we still wrestle with sin in our lives. It's the already, we've already received this gift, but, but the not yet is we're not yet all that we are going to be one day. And yet, even in Isaiah, even though the king has not arrived, he tells them to begin rejoicing anyways. Not only the messengers and the watchmen, but even the ruins of Jerusalem can rejoice. And throughout the book of Isaiah, we see even creation joins in this song of joy. In Isaiah 55, we find my favorite image of the trees of the field uh, clapping their hands in joy. But why rejoice when we don't have what we long for? Because this is what faith and hope look like. Faith sets its eyes upon God, whose promises can be trusted. Years ago, an S-4 submarine was rammed by a ship off the coast of Massachusetts. It sank immediately, and the entire crew was trapped in a prison house of death. Every effort was made to rescue the crew, but all ultimately failed. Near the end of the ordeal, a deep-sea diver, who was doing everything in his power to find a way for the crew's release, thought he heard tapping on the steel wall of the sunken sub. He placed his helmet up against the side of the vessel, and he realized it was Morse code. He attached himself to the side, and he spelled out in his mind the message being tapped from within. It was repeating the same question. The question from within was, is there any hope? Is there any hope? And our hopes in life can often feel this way. We hope we receive a negative test results. We hope our mother is cured of cancer. We hope we are accepted into the program. But deep within us, we wonder, is there any hope? But the Christian hope is entirely different. We never need to wonder whether there is any hope, for our rescuer has already set us free from our prison house. The Apostle Paul tells us that we can be sure of this hope because we have the Holy Spirit Hope, he says in Romans 5, does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What Paul is saying to us here is that we know that the hope that we, we, what we place our hopes in is certain because we have a present experience of God's love poured into our hearts. It's a present experience. And elsewhere he'll say that the Holy Spirit is like a deposit, like we would put Uh, a down payment on a house, and it guarantees that one day we are going to live in that house. And he says, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, that hope can never be taken away. And because of that, in the same passage, Paul can say, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, hope isn't always easy. In the midst of suffering or illness, it's hard to, I think, to direct our gaze anywhere besides our suffering, but, um, but is enough at, at times to hold on to that simple hope, however faint, that beyond the pain is not death, but life of, of glory. And our lives, you know, su- suffering we often see as opposite of joy, but suffering and joy uh, go hand in hand. In Romans 5, again, Paul says, we rejoice in our suffering and I, I'm going to kind of close with this. Uh, Frederick Buchner, in his book, Telling the Truth, says this, 
Astonishment and joy are what our faith finally points to. And even St. Paul said as much, though he was hardly less battered than the Jesus he preached by the time he had come through his 40 lashes, less one, his stonings and shipwrecks and sleepless nights. Yet at the end, uh, licking his wounds in a Roman lockup, he wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. But it is at the end that he wrote it. Rejoice is the last word and can be spoken only after the first word. The sheltering word can be spoken only after the word that leaves us without a roof over our heads. The answering word only after the word it answers. What he's saying is something we find in Isaiah. We can rejoice because we know what we were saved from. When we, joy is found when we know that God can transform our suffering into glory. When we see how he has taken the ruins of our life and rebuilt them. And that even in the ruins, we can still hear the voice in the distance. Good news, our God reigns. We can find joy in knowing that though we wait, one day the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. That the day that Isaiah foresaw is a day we look forward to as well, when the whole world will see him. In Revelation 1.7, we read this, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. That is the day that we are looking forward to with joy. So until then, we rejoice, knowing that our God is faithful and he will deliver. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you reign, that you are the God of the heavens and the earth, and that you sent your son, Jesus, to this world to defeat our greatest enemy, sin and death. By taking sin upon himself, Lord, you have set us free. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, Jesus Christ uh, is not distant from us, but that he, he reigns from heaven. You are so faithful to us, Lord. And though we often can't see how you are working, we thank you, Lord, that you uh, are a God who reigns even over what seems like chaos. So Lord, may we trust when we don't see you at work and may we look forward to the day when you will return. May we be people who can rejoice at all times and in all circumstances, knowing, Lord, that you are a God who is faithful to his promises and that what awaits us, Lord, is the hope of glory, of being with you face to face, seeing you as you are. So, Lord, we, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to think for a moment. Think about that time when you first heard the good news of Jesus Christ. If that time was this morning, that's fantastic. We're so glad that you were able to join us. If it wasn't um, and it was in the past, I want you to think about that moment. I want you to think about the, the joy that filled your heart. And now I want you to think about someone that you might know. Someone who doesn't know the joy that comes from knowing Jesus. I want you to think about how it might feel for them to experience that. And so I want to encourage you to go, to take the news of Jesus this holiday season and take it and share it, to show someone the joy that comes from knowing the Lord. So why don't we together sing of how we are going to go and tell it on the mountain, sharing the gospel with those around us.
thinking this week about how I think this Christmas season is going to look different for all of us. But here's the thing that maybe I think the blessing that can come out of this year in particular. I think we often always say that Jesus, you know, is the reason for the season. We hear things like that. But maybe in this time where some of these traditions are being stripped back, where we are in this time where we're, we're losing some, some of the familiarities of the Christmas season, maybe in this time we can really hold on to the one thing that can be never taken away from us, and that is the joy of knowing Jesus Christ, our Savior. The fact that that joy can never be taken away. And my encouragement for you this week is to really dwell upon that. As these, we've lost some of these traditions and these things, May that just rise to the surface in your life, and may you be able to rejoice and proclaim the good news uh, this holiday season. So we encourage you, uh, we have a Christmas Eve service uh, this, this Friday, or Friday? Thursday. Thursday is Christmas Eve um, and, uh, at 7 p.m., and we, we just encourage you to, to tune into that, and uh, we'll just be uh, singing and praising the Lord together and uh, welcoming our Savior. Uh, so we're going to close now with a closing Advent reading. And, and Advent, as we've kind of told you before, speaks to not only Christ's first coming, but his second coming as well. And so this, this passage that we conclude with speaks to that reality. Okay. Now, to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel... The message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is our prayer as we go. May God have the glory as we go. God bless you.